as you heard, I'm Jaden Jefferson, but aside from currently fighting, fighting the bugs out here, um, I am just excited to be hosting this panel once again. Um, I'm actually cousins to Paul Jackson, who's also on this call. So that's kind of how I got involved in this group. So I'll first start with uh, Matthew Goldman. Um, you mentioned a little bit about himself, but I'm currently getting FaceTime call. Apologies for that. Um, but, you know, I want to, you know, first start with him. You know, you mentioned that you uh, teach incarcerated people creative writing and um, composition writing. So tell me a little bit about your role and why it's important in our prison system. Yeah, without a doubt. So um, a little background for, for why I think it's so important. Uh, what kind of inspired me to get started in this? Um, my dad, who is actually here too, I'm going to put him on the spot real quick. Uh, my dad got into a bunch of trouble when he was younger. Uh, he has a pretty dramatic story uh, where he was basically at one point offered the option of either going to um, rehab or going to prison. Uh, he chose rehab. He told a story about being in a creative writing workshop while he was in rehab. And um, that kind of, you know, got me thinking about the role of writing and storytelling um, in recovery or in uh, rehabilitation of any sort, learning to articulate your story and um, just, you know, the power of being understood and understanding yourself better through writing, uh, that really appealed to me. And I used to get in a lot of trouble too and kind of one of the turning points of my life, not as much as my dad, but uh, one of the turning points for, for my life was um, taking a creative writing class. And, um, you know, I really struggled with school up until that point. It took me like 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. Uh, and then as soon as I signed up for a creative writing class, I went from like a C, D, and F student to like a straight A student. Um, so it helped me process my life in a lot of powerful ways too, especially uh, the further I went with creative writing. And I just really saw the potential there. I mean, it really seemed like a good way to um, give people a voice, uh, really give people a voice and, um, you know, not only give them a voice to understand themselves and to be understood, but then to use that voice to um, help change the world. I mean, no one understands uh, the, the situations um, that lead people to be incarcerated uh, or the reality of being incarcerated better than incarcerated people. So getting them out into the world and, and letting them share their stories uh, it just seemed like a, a, a way that I could actually, um, you know, use my skills to make a difference in the world. I'd like to pose this question to Mr. Bledsoe. Uh, we had mentioned earlier that, you know, younger black and brown people are primarily incarcerated in the prison system. So what do you believe needs to change in order to stop that pipeline uh, that black and brown people are sent to prison? Well, I think it's um, it's a. Um complicated problem. And so many people have responsibilities. Uh, the system is um, a, a biased system. Uh, it is a system that has been designed to target and incarcerate um, African Americans and Latinos. That being said, we could lessen the problem ourselves if we had more uh, responsibility. And it goes back to a couple of things. Uh, the idea of it takes a, a village to raise someone. So we need to be more proactive in making sure that we steer our young people in the, in the right direction and trying to provide uh, opportunities so people are not in uh, difficult circumstances uh, where they have to go and commit crimes. And also like what Regent Price was just stating about, about the fights between the Crips and the Bloods and the idea, how do we, uh, in some communities, that's all that young people have. Uh, they have to go through one of those to have a sense of family. So we need to have a real analysis about what's going on in our communities to try to help and provide something because we can't expect an individual child with, uh, with a parent under meager circumstances to be able to, to, to withstand that, right? That's just not uh, likely it happens, but that's the exception rather than the rule. And, and the final thing I want to say about this too, uh, maybe two, two points, and that is uh, we have to uh, uh, to be more responsible ourselves. You know, as as a as a practicing lawyer, and I'm sure Evelyn can tell you about this. When when you show up uh, to the jury pool to pick a jury on Monday, and 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 you see that uh, blacks and browns are already underrepresented in the pool, and the judge around the country asked this one question: There's anybody else for any other reason that thinks they shouldn't be able to serve? And 80 to 90 percent of the additional people who who stand up and want to get off uh, for some reason, even though it's not a required reason that they not serve, are black and brown. 
So you're, you're very limited in who ultimately ends up serving on your jury. So what you'll find is you go through most of these terrible situations uh, and you'll find that you probably won't have any minorities on the jury. But when I've had one minority on the jury, I've been able to do wonders just by having one minority on the jury. So, and, but the second thing is with your minority on the jury, you got to make sure you understand this one thing. And I want you to understand this and hear this. No one's ice is colder, okay? No one's ice is colder. You have a responsibility when you get on that jury to, 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 to not worry about whether you're out for three days or four days. You know, the, that person's life, like some relative of yours, their life could depend on you. So you don't need to flip over and let somebody dominate you, which happens too often. Uh, and we find more of a problem, ironically, with blacks in the middle class than, than working class or poor blacks, because middle class blacks seem to be really much more apt to really uh, be intimidated and moved over. And I guess the, the, the final point in, in reference to this is we need to be more sophisticated in how we understand uh, what we do in reference to handling criminal cases. We know there's a problem with when you get court appointed lawyers, uh, but you need to have documentation. We don't need to be on telephones. You need to try to write her. There's a book, I can't remember the name of this book, but by an African-American criminal defense lawyer and an African-American journalist out of Atlanta about three years ago. I, uh, we bought copies and gave them, I gave them to every state, pre, uh, every uh, branch president that we have in the Texas State Conference because I think that's important to know how to get through the system. How do you know if your lawyer really is working for you? You know, what we find is so many people are required to plead guilty because their lawyers tell them to plead guilty and they're absolutely innocent. And so that's a, that's a real issue are a real problem, but you have to be affirmative in that. And and this whole thing with telephone calls that we do, no, no, you need to start sending documentation. That's what the bar looks at, okay? And so you need to send them an email, send them a fax, send them a certified letter. You need to do things like that to make sure that people know that you're watching. If people aren't working for you, um, then you need to, to, to address that. You need to be affirmative. You need to be all that in, in, in reference to uh, Matt's story, one final thing in the criminal justice arena. Uh, there is a book called A Knock at Midnight, not Dr. King's book, which is a wonderful book about all these great sermons, et cetera. And I love that book. Have that, but there's one called A Knock at Midnight by uh, Brittany Barnett. Uh, she's a young lawyer in Texas, and she's done an incredible work in getting people out of prison. But she does what, what Matt is talking about now. She writes these stories where you really get to know people, right? And you get to know who the defendants are. You get to know their personal story. And so she's gotten people uh, 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 paroled, uh, even by the federal government, even by President Trump, that people thought it really wasn't possible. But when you really go and look at someone's background and understand why they are where they are, it really humanizes them. So we really need to uh, have that aspect. So I really highly recommend that book. So, Mr. Price, while in your position, you have uh, you know, developed multiple programs to address issues in our criminal justice system. So what, you know, what type of programs have you developed and what do you, how do you measure success in them? I try to measure success, especially from being on the Board of Regents, on how many uh, sweethearts in the criminal justice system do not visit the criminal justice system. But let me take you back and uh, on something Mr. Blesso mentioned earlier that it's been a heartburn for me for over 20 years, I would say. I, back in Dallas, I used to fight the Dallas Morning News and fight the, the major three, four news networks because I told them that uh, the problem is the first five minutes of every newscast is always a negative toward African-American young men doing something violent. And if any race, not just white people, but any race, if you're Asian, Indian, Arab, you name it, if you get a heavy dose of that every day, uh, ultimately you're going to start believing that. And every city around the United States, the first five minutes of every newscast is something negative about young brothers doing something bad in a particular community. And at the end of the newscast, it's someone of another race doing something wonderful, like getting a cat out of the, out of the tree or getting a kite from out of the tree. There's always something pleasant uh, or building a community garden or uh, helping a little lost puppy. But if you get inundated by that every day, seven days a week, something negative about our brothers and sisters, we also consume that as young people and don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So that's, I know it's not uh, true to what Mr. Benson was saying, but that's been my heart burn issue for a long time, uh, that issue right there. And let me also apologize to everyone who's listening. I'm in Denver, Colorado, and I'm up in the mountains. And uh, someone accidentally told me recently that it's kind of hard to breathe when you're talking up here. 
So, <laughs> so if I'm gasping for breath, I'm not sick. I'm just trying to breathe while I'm up here in Denver and doing this conversation. But that's my number one issue is the African-American community challenging our news work, network everywhere to stop portraying our young people, especially young African-American men, as animals that are out of control. For Mr. Gold, uh, Goldman, you know, your role is directly involved in the prison system. You're speaking with people that are incarcerated and, you know, trying to turn their life, lives around in some, you know, capacity. You know, how important do you think it is that we uh, put in these reforms while people are incarcerated so that they don't end back up in prison? Yeah, that's that's the tricky thing. I mean, um they definitely need a lot more support when they get out. I think the the work that I've been doing recently, I see so much potential um, with the people I've been working at. I mean, I'm helping coach them on writing college essays right now, uh, applications to get into college and everything. And just like a little bit of hope for them goes a long way. So yeah, we need to definitely make structural changes. Um, but the thing that's been getting to me, the thing that I've been focused on the most recently is... Um, preventing um, them from getting incarcerated in the first place, like Mr. Bledsoe was saying a little while ago. Um, just like, I mean, it, it goes into what Mr. Price was saying too. It's, it's this combination of things where every single person has some variation of the same story of being labeled a certain way since a young age, um, people not having faith in them, um, you know, not getting support in school, um, you know, growing up in kind of a more bleak environment where they just, you know, they don't see much hope for themselves. And there's always some variation of, you know, this, this seemed like the easy way to get out of my situation. And I made a mistake. And, and here I am now. And a lot of their mistakes are no different than some of the mistakes I made when I was a kid. That's the thing that really gets to me a lot too. But it's just these over-policed areas. And there's this combination of, you know, the people see themselves a certain way. And so they end up doing certain things and society sees them that way too. And so punishes them more harshly. And they don't necessarily have the tools to, um, you know, see much hope beyond incarceration. And what's, what's really been cool, the, the juvenile hall that I teach at has been um, the coolest experience I've ever had as a teacher so far. Um, a little encouragement goes so, so far with these kids. And just working with them on undoing those labels, that's been the main thing I've been focused on. You know, we've been really focused on exploring the labels that they wear, um, exploring the way those labels have affected them, exploring different ways to talk about those labels, to write about those labels, and, and to really challenge them. And, um, you know, I think when I think about incarceration in general, um, you know, question I like to ask people about it is, do you believe it's about punishment or do you believe it's about rehabilitation? And I strongly believe it's about rehabilitation. And if we don't believe it's about rehabilitation, like what's even the point in the prison system? It just is making more crime if we're just punishing people. It's not setting people up for any sort of success. So I think that, yes, we need to do a bunch of structural changes to prevent people from ending up in prison. That seems like a, a, a lot. I mean, it's it almost feels like an unsurmountable task at points. I mean, there's just so many things that that go into it. Um, so for me, I think a real change that we can do right now that can make a very important and lasting difference is change the way we educate people in incarcerate or incarcerated people. Having um, you know better education systems um, in jails and in juvenile halls and stuff like that. I've kind of seen since I've been doing this. I mean. The juvenile hall I work at, again, it's wonderful. The, the wardens who work over there love the kids. Um, they're so, I mean, they do so much work on my behalf to make sure that the students are um, participating in, in the projects we work on and that their work can make it to me. Like they only have pencils and papers to write with and they have to email everything over to me. So they have to like scan, um, you know, this pencil drawn stuff. And oftentimes it's too light for me to read. And so the wardens will go over everything with pen for me. And, you know, they're really, they're really working to on behalf of these kids, but that's not the case at the jail where sometimes they don't even really let me in uh, printed materials. Can t I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm a month and a half into this semester, the summer semester, and we just got our first printed materials to give these students. So it's been a month and a half where they haven't gotten anything to work on. Um, so, you know, a little bit of support from the system goes such a long way. And I think we really could do a lot of good for this world by having, um, you know, proper education systems within, within, uh, um, jails, prisons, juvenile halls, whatever it may be, that really encourage people, that, that really work with them and teach them things that are meaningful to them and, and helpful to them, you know, empowering. 
Um, yeah. You had mentioned a little bit about labels and how that can significantly impact a certain neighborhood when it comes to over-policing. You know, do you see that there is a problem with the narrative? Um, you can, of course, during the during last year, a lot of people were interviewed about the death of George Floyd and how uh, those com- over-policed communities were really impacted by that and have been for years. So do you believe there's a problem with the narrative that, you know, every officer is looking, has the right intentions in mind when that's not the case, that everyone has different intentions in law enforcement? Yeah, very much so. And I mean, I think even well-intentioned officers, I mean, we don't necessarily recognize our biases sometimes, you know, it's just kind of, it's, it's a subtle thing. I mean, even these students, even these, even these kids have biases against themselves. They have, you know, things that they believe about themselves. So even the, the best intentioned police officer, I think still uh, grapples with those biases and it's, it's very hard to overcome. And not only that, but um, you know, standing up against the injustices in, in police departments uh, usually gets you in more trouble than actually being the one who, who commits the crime. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I think that it's, um, you know, I don't know what the a, a good answer for that is. Um, you know, I, I, I got into a debate with a friend the other day about uh, the idea of sensitivity training. And, you know, there's such a, a strong push towards sensitivity training right now. But at the same time, when an employer forces you to go to sensitivity training, how many people are really taking that as seriously as they should? How many people really like, you know, uh, invest in that or how many people just feel like it's something they're being forced to do for work? So I, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what the good answer is for any of this stuff. I think it's just we need to make such a, a strong cultural shift in the way we see and talk about other people. And, you know, like Mr. Price was saying, like, you know, when the news just bombards you with, with images of certain people doing um, bad things and describing people a certain way, and not just the news. I mean, you go online and it's just, it, it's, it's everywhere. Every conversation in any news story in entertainment, you know, I'm a big fan of this reality TV show, Big Brother. And um, it's this social experiment where a bunch of people get locked in a house and just, you know, it's eliminate each other and stuff. And I haven't been able to watch it this year because, and it's one of, it's always been one of my greatest joys because there's just so much racism in the fan base. They cast the most diverse cast they've ever had because there's, you know, because of George Floyd and because of the, the, uh, cultural narratives going on right now. And that's just brought out the worst from the fan base of this show where everything is just like, I, I mean, it's just everywhere. And I, I look for it more than I think a lot of people do, but it's, you know, it subtly gets into you, no matter who you are, it's always kind of, you know, getting into you. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how we change all of those perceptions, but I think it's one of the most important things we can do. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Bledsoe, what has been the Texas NAACP response to this, uh, to these, these new calls for reform? What are some conversations that you've been having with uh, those that have much more power than the average person? And what are you uh, doing to make sure that these changes are implemented? Well, I mean, uh, I have to be honest, uh, we're not having as much success as we wanted to. I think the far right has been able to successfully um, position themselves and intimidate departments. We've had some real successes. I think we put together a plan, the Texas NAACP called the George Floyd Save the World Criminal Justice Reform Plan. And uh, and I think it's by far the best document that is on it. I mean, I'm just, and I I think I can be objective even though uh, we wrote it, but I think we, we, we tried to uh, enlist uh, educators and academics and uh, affected individuals and uh, and come up with a real plan. And so it's really a comprehensive plan and it includes a lot of things that you can do in community. We've had three or four police departments to adopt um, uh, our plan. Um, um, we know that, um, uh, that it does work. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, it does do is it it encourages our units to try to engage a community-wide dialogue because unless you have a community-wide di- dialogue you don't really address the problem and so uh, and what we recommend is you have everyone from the far left to the to the far right um, that can engage in an intelligent conversation as part of it because that's the only way that you come up with good policy and we have specific recommendations on policy changes that you can make at the local level because putting all our money in what Congress might do or putting all our money in what the legislature might do is foolish. Uh, It's just not going to happen. 
uh, and what they will come up with will be so watered down that it will help, but it won't help nearly the way we need it to help. But you have the power on the local level to go in and sit down with something like our package and say, uh, you know, these are the kinds of changes uh, that will make a difference. I was so proud this session of the Texas legislature that uh, a law got through, the George Floyd law didn't pass, mainly because of bigotry. Uh, and we supported it and pushed it really heavily. Uh, but there was a Bose law uh, named after the uh, uh, Bottom John, uh, the man that was killed in his home up in Dallas uh, that region price can probably tell you a lot of details about, uh, but, um, uh, representative Carl Sherman, um, out of, uh, DeSoto, uh, got a law passed that says that, uh, when a police officer engages the public, we're going to require that they activate their cameras, uh, and that they keep them, uh, operating until 15 minutes after the incident is over. Uh, that's huge. Uh, because that one law, because I think that when you see a video and you understand on a video what actually uh, happens, um, that that can, even if you don't get some of the policy changes, you'll be able to know the truth. Uh, you know, what would have happened if we had seen if Trayvon Martin had actually been on videotape, right? Uh, so I think that uh, that's a huge boon. We're going to continue to push for uh, other changes such as, uh, you know, and, I, uh, and we did get some other laws passed as well, working with, you know, Senator West and uh, others and the legislature, uh, Representative Reynolds. Uh, so we were able to get some other ones passed uh, to, I think, the database requirement, trying to uh, keep a database in reference to the officers who do engage in misconduct. Because the sad thing that we've seen is that also would go out and wrongfully kill someone knowing they're insulated from prosecution in the criminal justice system and they'll resign so they're not uh they're not terminated and uh, they don't end up having a situation where if they're terminated under certain circumstances the department can uh designate them as not employable as a criminal justice professional and lock them out so they just resign and go to another area and what we find is frequently they end up engaging in the same type of conduct when they go to another jurisdiction. Would you say that is a problem because there has been a, a growing uh, concern about police unions and their role in hindering any potential reforms within police departments? Do you see their role being significant and why these reforms aren't taking place? Jane, yeah, what's such an excellent question, outstanding question. Uh, that is uh, the biggest problem. You know, what we find is that the police chiefs administrators are largely along there with us. Uh, they see the problem. They actually want to bring about change, uh, but the unions are obligated to protect an officer under any and every circumstance. So they can go out there and in a cold-blooded fashion murder somebody and you'll have them pushing to make sure uh, nothing happens uh, with them. So one of the things we talk about in our plan uh, is uh, ways and means to address that. In Texas, we have what's called meet and confer. So they end up with this document that's kind of like a document under which the police department will operate and the leadership of the union negotiates with the leadership of the city uh, and they come up with a document. Uh, what we've seen is because of the politicization and the strong packs that the police departments have and the police officers have, they've been able to run roughshod over uh, the city council. The city council do a poor job of representing the public interest. So one thing we've pushed for is trying to make sure that when they have those kinds of discussions uh, that uh, the community has a, uh, uh, actually has a seat. And the other thing that we were pushing for this session but did not succeed with, we think some issues should be taken off the table and not be a matter of discussion in the meet and confer. We think some things uh, uh, need to be just addressed straight up as a matter of state law, where certain kinds of misconduct, et cetera, uh, won't be insulated by uh, some provision that's in the meet and confer agreement. But no, the unions are a big problem in all the legislation that we have. We have so much dialogue and, and positive communications with the police chiefs. It's really the rank and file and the unions at the legislative level and at the local level that present the most problems. 
to Mr. Price with a background in criminal justice. You know, one of the issues that a lot of people, a lot of things people have taken issue with is the uh, private prisons and their enroll in this pipeline of black and brown people going back into prison. So they operate as a business rather than a state run prison. So what's the issue with private prisons if there's one at all? Well, I, Mr. Bless will be much more knowledgeable about how the private prison system work in the state of Texas versus public prisons. As we know, anything private is for profit. Uh, it's not in the best interest of the public. So I would probably defer that one to Mr. Bledsoe to give you much more knowledge about that issue. But um, I'm an advisor to the uh, Polish Union here in Dallas, as well as a couple of other Polish unions up north uh, from Mr. Bledsoe down in Houston. And a lot of the Polish Union uh, presidents share with me some of their thoughts and what's going on in the system in regards to what, you know, city council members want to do. I know the Dallas Police Union president, his number one issue is he's defunding the police. That's his number one problem. He calls me about weekly about it. And we, we talk through so many issues, and some are good, some are bad, but all they want to do is make sure they have good policing now. He would tell you in a minute, if I were to get Mike on the call, they do not want bad cops around. Because bad cops make all of them look bad. But at the same time, they don't want a linchpin, so every time an officer makes a mistake, everybody wants to go after every police officer. So it's, it's a really uh, balancing line we're trying to do. Because when I get the feedback from the union, and they had me come to a lot of the meetings, they're frustrated as well. They're frustrated with the lack of support from the community. They're frustrated, of course, the lack of pay that they receive. And it's one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, being a police officer. And I've had the opportunity to ride with some officers late at night on patrol, and they do have to make split-second decisions. And I always, what I talk to the police union about is getting a better 911 caller. Because the police officer, all they do is receive something from dispatch, a description of a person in the incident. And when they show up, that's all they have. They don't know the whole story when they show up. So what I talk to the police unions about working with their different cities to get more training for the dispatch people because when they call those officers to a call, they have to be able to tell the officer what's actually going on so that the officer, he or she, will make a bad decision. And unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is happening from the call centers before the officer even get to the situation where they're going ahead to the violence issue. But uh, Mr. Blesser, once again, could probably weigh in a little bit better and much more knowledgeable about private prisons versus public prisons. I also just wanted to follow up quickly. You mentioned the issues on the dispatch side of uh, responding to different incidents. Would you say there may be to be there is a greater need for more training on the uh, side of the law enforcement officers? Yeah, there's some training, but you can train you can train a dog so much he's still gonna bark when you tell him to bark. He's still gonna eat when you tell him to eat. Training is important, but you get to the point you can be overtrained, and the training doesn't help. But I'm telling you, the key issue with most cities is that dispatch. And we don't really talk about it because we focus so much on the officer-related shootings or the officer-related incident. But those officers are responding to whatever that dispatcher tells him or her. So before the officer even gets to that crime scene, he or she needs to have the total picture from dispatch. Not that there's some guy in a blue hat with a gun and that's it. You know, and the guy, the guy with the blue hat and the gun may be the good person trying to protect other people. So we got to get the dispatchers more training, more sensitive, sensitive training, too, because those dispatchers are the ones who tell the police officers where to go and which, which community they need to target. Some dispatchers let some calls go through. Some dispatchers uh, have a 911 issue with a particular phone call, a call to come through, rather. So it's really important that, as a nation, we really put the focus on training the dispatchers as they relay the information to the officers once they receive the 911 call. Now to Mr. Bledsoe, you know, we, we had just talked a little bit about private prisons. So can we a little bit expound on that and some of the issues that you may have with private prisons? Well, uh, there's, uh, I think Regent Price nailed the most important point, though, and that is that there is an inconsistency between having private prisons for profit uh, incarcerating individuals. Because what we have seen, uh, we see a lot, for example, of private entities that have local jail contracts. And what you find is that they have quotas in there. And, and what we find is that there have even been instances where judges have been corrupted because they need to make sure that 
uh, the numbers stay above a certain level. So when somebody may be entitled to bail or what have you, they don't get bail uh, because they're looking at the dollars and cents on the contract. Uh, and so uh, we think that's clearly against good public policy, but most of these things are insulated from public view and you have to talk to individuals that have been in the meetings to find out uh, what the circumstances are, but their idea is to have profit. So how do you have profit? You, uh, you put them under the most meager types of circumstances uh, that you can, uh, that the law would uh, allow for, uh, and uh, you have as many incarcerated as, uh, as you can. And so that just goes to the economies of scale, how you maximize your profit. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge uh, issue. And I think Regent Price mentioned another thing that and I want to I recommend this book for everyone. It's called Standoff by Jamie Thompson. And it's it's real uh, look into the Dallas Police Department. And it's the, the whole thing with the, the, the shooting there when the, when the gentleman shot the police officers uh, in response to what had happened with Philandra Castile. And I think he ended up shooting seven officers or something. But it, it takes you into the lives of so many people that were involved and it lets you see the complicated nature of what we're talking about and even features an, an African-American officer who's kind of like the one who can see through the eyes of the community, but who's a tough, good cop, too. Right. And so he's able to speak in both uh, in, in both types of language. And so I think it's really an outstanding uh, book and discussion for uh for how those things happen so i highly uh recommend that book now at this point in our round table i'll now take some questions that we may have uh from anyone else in today's group